morning, everyone, and welcome to the National Book Festival from the Library of Congress. My name is Guy Lamolinara, and I work at the library. I'm here with two wonderful authors, Ann Patchett and Kate DiCamillo. Ann Patchett's new book is The Dutch House, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. And Kate's new book is Stella Endicott and the Anything is Possible poem, which is the fifth installment in her Dekawu Drive series. Welcome to both of you. And I wanna let people know that if they go to the nationalbookfestival.com and log in that you two have recorded a session together. And I've watched that session and you're, you're in for a treat if you go and watch that because it's like watching two stand-up comedians. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you will love it. So please watch that video. So we're gonna okay. have a great conversation with the two of them today. And I'm gonna start out with Kate and ask you about your new book. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's about? Um, I was thinking as you were reading, hi Guy, hi Anne. Hi. Um, hi. I, I was thinking as you were reading that introduction, Guy, uh, how, how dignified I sound. Um, you know, so uh, there's Anne, Pulitzer Prize finalist, and then me writing about Dekawu Drive. So this is- <laughs> Yeah, but the point is, lost okay i like with the, what he could have said is ann patchett loser of the pulitzer prize <laughs> how exciting it's just how you spin it right i lose every single year it's just this year they're pointing it out <laughs> that's funny and i haven't heard that routine before so mm -hmm. so stella ended up with anything by the way yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell it. I'll tell it very quickly. Um, it's about uh, it, it, the all the the wonderful people who live on Deckwood Drive. Stella Endicott is one of them. Um, she makes a new friend at school. She writes a poem about a pig. Anything can happen there. I summed it up, didn't I, Ann? Well, you you left out my favorite part where they get trapped in the janitor's closet. It's all about fear um, and kind of powering through your fear with just a certain amount of self-confidence and presence. It really is a very good book for this time. It's a good book for any time. It's my favorite of the Dekawu Drives and I am a Dekawu Drive completist. Um, <laughs> it, it seems really tough when when the the rubber hits the road, he, he crumbles and, and little Stella Endicott, who doesn't seem quite as brave, really steps up and takes control and sees him through because you never and know it, it would be up to you to see something profound in this but i do think that it's also um that thing about how much comfort there is and just they are in this very small space together and they are trapped and they take comfort from each other right and do you know how hard it is to write a book that's set entirely in a dark editorial <laughs> closet in a middle school? So it's just a challenge I wanted to set for myself. And, yeah. and anyway, speaking of, of taking comfort um, from each other, that I, I just want to like broaden that out and say uh, like how much comfort I take from your friendship, but how much comfort I take from this community of people who read and this community of people who get together and talk about books. So this is just a big thank you to um, the world of readers and writers and, and how we get to be friends across during the Thank time. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you so much. And tell us a little bit about the Dutch house. Um, a brother and a sister grow up in a fabulous, beautiful home. Their stepmother tosses them out. And even though they go on to have perfectly nice lives, they just cannot stop chewing on the hurt of their youth. That's the nice thing about having a book that's been out for a while. You really yeah. are able to get it down to a sentence. Yeah. And wow. That was set, very it's yeah. set, yeah. okay. It's set, it starts in November, <laughs> <laughs> and it's cold outside. And then from there, you set your book in a Philadelphia suburb. What familiarity do you have with that area? Um, my best friend from college, Erica Schultz, who used to be Erica Booksbaum um lived in in cheltenham wincote jenkintown that that area of the her parents address was actually wincote but because i lived in nashville i would go home 
with her for uh, the weekends because we were in school at Sarah Lawrence in New York. And so we would drive to the suburbs of Philadelphia or take the train. And um, that's how I have a knowledge of that area. Just a great, warm fondness. Um, would always go, would always go home to, for the high holy days, you know, as one takes one's little Catholic girlfriend home from college was nice. <laughs> hey, how is it that you two have become friends? You don't live anywhere near each other. Uh, we, we live near each other, um, uh, psychically speaking, however. That was a total setup, yeah, right. <laughs> I was going to say, Guy just handed me a softball. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the funny thing is that, um, you know, of course, uh, I have been a, a fan of Anne for a, a long time, and, um, and uh, like, you know, fangirling kind of thing. And then I went and did um, an event at the store in Nashville and uh, Anne came to my presentation. That was uh, quite lovely of her above and beyond. And then what happened to Anne, and you never really tell this part of it though, is that you were sick that winter. So I had been there and then you were, you were sick. You just, you were, it was, it was like a, a month almost. And you were working on the Dutch house, but you couldn't, really work on anything because and so you started you wanted to read something that would and and you started to read my books all and, of them Every and, and then, uh she wrote me and i i was super excited and um wrote her back and i was a little bit intimidated at first she always gets mad at me for saying that but it's true and then we just um she's just you become one of my friends. It's where I write in the morning and say, hey, I flossed my teeth. Have you flossed your teeth yet? Yeah, that's basically <laughs> what the friendship is based on. Minutia, boring minutia. And, it's, and I won't say what happened to you yesterday. Can I? Oh, sure. Go ahead. You got bit by a pig. So that kind of thing. That's where our friendship is rock solid. Because I, I um, emailed her this morning and I said, how's your pig bite? And you know I, what? Anybody that I can write that sentence to, friend for life. Yeah. That makes so much sense. <laughs> and it, it, while I was at the goat farm with my sister's <laughs> grandchildren, and was big, I like, I don't have a phone, but I had an iPad with me, and so I dug my iPad out of my bag, and I was like, Fluffy, I was bitten by a pig. <laughs> it, it's like it's, it's a title. Bruno, for a pig named Bruno. <laughs> Speaking this, pig of I, this pig and I had a very beautiful moment, and it was so warm and tender between us that I went to my sister and asked for a couple of sliced apples that she had brought for the grandchildren to enjoy at the goat farm. The goats, no interest in sliced apples. I bring two sliced apples, one for Bruno and one for Bruno's friend, Claire, give them each some apple, and then Bruno, enraged by the fact that I did not have a second piece of apple for him, bit me. Speaking of pigs, Kate, you wrote a lot about pigs and other animals. Why is that? Why, why do I write so much about animals? Uh, it's such a hard question to answer because it is not in any way a conscious choice. And, and, and often I've thought I should try to write something without an animal. Um, and, but, you know, I love animals. That's one thing. Um, and the other is, I think, so many of the stories that I read when I was a kid, um, the Paddington Bears, Stuart Little, um, The Mouse and the Motorcycle, um, they're, they featured those animal protagonists. And, and so I think that's part of it. And also, this sounds very calculating, but when you write about an animal, um, people let down their guard more easily. Don't you think that's true, Anne? That yeah. people are, are, are like less, they, they, so the reader opens their heart much more quickly to an animal protagonist sometimes than they do to a human one. It's a, it's a shortcut to the human heart. I think also kids are, are looking for themselves. You know, kids like books about kids that are sort of like them. And, and yet every kid can identify with the animal. Right, right. Oh, that's a good point. I should yeah. always take notes when you talk, Ann. But... Don't you? I thought you did. <laughs> okay, Guy, how are you doing trying to wrangle us? How's it I'm going? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Trying to get a word in here. 
Um, <laughs> That's the story of my life. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I have a question here from one of our listeners, and she's asking, how is it that Katie Camillo helped you write the end of the Dutch house? That's a great question because she absolutely did. Um, I'm going to let her tell you. Do you have any her. royalties for that? Uh, no. she, <laughs> she extracts her royalties daily. Okay. So um, I had written The Dutch House. When I write a book, I know how it's going to end before I start writing it. I wrote the book. I made a huge mistake. I had to throw it out and start it over. It was a very, very different book when I rewrote it. So I'm writing it without knowing the ending the second time. I get all the way to the end of the second draft, but I and there needs to be a denouement. There needs to be just a little scene at the end, and I don't know what that's going to be. And at this point in our friendship, uh, Kate knows all she knows about the book are the names of the characters, the name of the book, and just sort of that it's about a house. And I, she said one morning, you know, how's the ending going? And I said, yeah, it's, it's going well. I just don't have that last beat, that last scene. And about, I don't know, six minutes later, she wrote me back a paragraph and she said, here, this is how it ends. I and was in, fact, in fact, that is how it ended. And it was not the direction that I was thinking of going. Mm -hmm. Now, she wrote me a paragraph, and out of that paragraph, I made 12 pages. But the important thing was where she placed the two main characters. And I thought, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. And it was perfect. That was a big help. Thanks, Fluff. I appreciate that. You know, it, it's like she kept on saying that really helped me, and I, I just didn't believe her at all. Did and you then, read the house? Who, me? Did you, when, I mean, when I finished it, did you read it? <laughs> are you talking to me? Or are you talking to Guy? Yes, yes, I read it in manuscript. You're talking to me? <laughs> I read it in manuscript. Yes. You read it, that's correct. And what did yeah. you see at the end of the book? Uh, something very similar to what I had, um, yeah. Correct. Written. Yeah. Yeah, it's so surreal. And 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 in honor of of me getting to do that, I got to be what what was my reward? Not not royalties guy. Instead, mm -hmm. fluffy. That's fluffy. what I get for my efforts. I get named fluffy. <laughs> right. <laughs> in the Dutch house, fluffy de Camillo. Right, fluffy de Camillo in the Dutch house. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, guy. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm good. I have a question about your friendship with each other. And do you ever use any aspect of your friendship in your writing? Wow, that's Does it tough. ever work its way into your writing? You know, I plan to. I plan to. I haven't gotten there yet, but something. What's that plan? That's a Clovis and Jelly. Oh, God. I can't believe you would say their name. Wow. When the time wow. comes that I get to Clovis and Jelly, then um, that will definitely be us. Yes. Wow. And you know how I, I would answer that in a totally different direction. And I would say that it, and I mean, it, she underpins the work because I've gotten to the point now in this friendship where she's one of my first readers. And um, I never would have thought I would have gotten there. I would have thought that's too terrifying to have um, a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Um, when, you know, like, remember <laughs> reading, but, um, she is so central to, I, I write, she's one of those people that I write toward now. Um, and so it's just, it, so she's there implicitly and, and the stories that I tell, so it's a good question. Yeah, and let me, and let me answer that too, because this is really interesting. So on Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, I have a piece, an essay in the New Yorker called Three Fathers. And I wrote that. Fantastic. Uh, but I wrote that because Fluffy's father died. And when your dad died, mm. um, and she was talking about wanting to write about it, and I said, jumping on the bad wagon. Well, you know, I had three fathers. I, I feel like I'm somewhat of an expert in this now, in, in the loss of the father, uh, because my mother was married three times and these were three people who were hugely important in my life. And I said, I've been meaning to write this essay for uh, three years since my 
last stepfather died and I've been thinking about it and thinking about it and I've just never started it. So I said, if you write about your father, I'll write about my father's. And I don't, I, I absolutely would not have written that essay were it not for you. So thank Let's you. Let's just switch back to the fact that my uh, essay about my father, which I did, is not going to be in the New Yorker this week. However, Anne's <laughs> is. And, and it is truly an astonishment. It is, it's a gift, it's a wonder, it's funny, and, and it's hopeful, and it's what everybody needs to read right now. And when is it actually on the newsstands? Is it like, you, I think on Tuesday. It's the October 5th issue, but I, I think that comes on the stands this Tuesday. Tuesday. What's so interesting about the essay that you wrote about your father is that it then later morphed yep. into speech. Um, and the essay that you wrote about your father was fine. Mm -hmm. And then morphed into a speech that was just one of the best things you've ever done. So it, it's been very interesting how these pieces are really, you know, things become really interconnected when yep. you're writing together and you're having conversations. Um, like an essay that I'm writing right now, I feel like everything I am going to put into that essay I'm saying to you over the phone, we talk on the phone maybe once a week and email about 15 times a day. Uh, and, and I'm working through it with you as I'm writing it. Yeah, it it's, it's fascinating actually to sit and talk about this because it, it, it all happens. I, I haven't really examined it. Okay, Guy, sorry, here we okay, are. Not a problem. We I see quite a few questions about Edward Tulane. A lot of people okay. want to know about whether it's being made into a film. Uh, I do believe that that will happen. Um, it has, you know, there's a, a, a fabulous script. Um, there's, and it has been optioned. And, you know, it's one of those things that uh, we get close. And then, but I do, I, I think it will happen. And in the meantime, you know, right before the world changed, um, Edward was um, going to be uh, an opera here in uh at the uh, Minneapolis, uh, the Minnesota Opera. So uh, hopefully that will happen once um, the world starts back up. Um, and um, yeah, also, you know, Edward is, it's, it's such a strange, it's, it's one, it's the first book that Anne uh, read of mine. And it's, it's a book that keeps on opening doors for me because that's where Anne started. So in, in a weird way, Anne, uh, Anne came to me via Edward, um, and this friendship came via Edward. But Edward it has been on a Korean uh, soap opera that um, people have just, uh, so it, 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 he's been all over the world. He's in a traveling puppet show in Russia. And so it's just, a, it's a book and a story that I don't even feel like it belongs to me. It just keeps on going out and doing things and bringing me gifts. So a movie would be a gift. I didn't know that he was on a Korean soap opera. Yeah, there was a character who um, read the book on the soap opera, carried it around, and um, and and talked about it. And it just it became a, um, the best selling book in Korea. People just downloaded it and read it. It was just it's kind of an amazing thing. Yeah, you're frozen, Anne. I don't know. Is that just for me? I can't. I have no idea. I, I came into this conversation a hard way, and I'm still, it's still hard. <laughs> well, at least we can hear you. And you've got a pleasant look on your face. A minute ago, something popped up on my screen that says we can no longer hear you. So oh, we I can, can hear, hear you. you. We can hear yeah. you just fine. Yeah. And you've written about friendships with other women authors. Um, have yeah. you ever had any close friendships with male authors? And if so, how do those relationships differ? Uh, <laughs> they don't actually, they, they don't differ at all. Um, but two of my very, very best friends are male authors. Uh, Patrick Ryan, the Dutch house is dedicated to Patrick Ryan. He wrote the dream life of astronauts and um, send me and is really such an unsung hero of our time. And uh, like, there are no words, there are no words for how much I love Patrick Ryan um, who comes to our house, usually for several weeks a year and works here and we have writer's camp and, and our lives and our writing very, very connected. I have about 10 pounds worth of mixed nuts 
in the back of my car, all boxed up and ready to mail to Patrick right now because he lives um, in Manhattan where I always worry that he doesn't have enough food because he's really being good about staying in. Um, and then my other great writer friend who is male is Kevin Wilson, who wrote the terrific book, Nothing to See Here, that came out last December. And Kevin, I've known Kevin since he was 21 years old. He used to be my dog sitter. His youngest son is named Patchett. Uh, which is much, much better than losing the Pulitzer Prize. I wish when people introduce me, they would say, and Kevin Wilson named his second son after her. <laughs> so, and Kevin, Kevin and I are so close, but Kevin, I almost feel like Kevin's my son. Um, my, he's one of the only people that I have really maternal feelings towards. So yeah. Those are my those are my two very close. I have other. I mean, I could I could just name drop all day long and tell you other male writers that I'm friendly with. But those were those are the two that I'm super close to. Have you two ever thought about writing a book together? Yes, we have. Yeah. And it, it didn't go anywhere. But you never know. Life is long and full of surprises. Yeah, I yeah, and it, it might happen, but I feel like we like, and that was another thing where it was great when I just like I thought no, well it doesn't matter, we won't have that here. Let's move on to another question. But yeah, it's anything's possible. People are interested about becoming professional writers, and Kate, I've heard your story about about how you became published and everything you went through. Could you tell us that story? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I can, I, I, how much time do I have? Um, <laughs> and, and, and Guy, you've heard it before and Anne has heard it before. I'll just try to get it. Um, as, as, a, as, a, as a, somebody who loved to read, I went to college and majored in English because what else are you going to do? Right. And, um, and then I had a professor who said to me in my senior year, you have quote, a certain facility with words you should consider graduate school end quote. And I thought, this person is trying to tell me that I'm the next Flannery O'Connor and is just, um, doesn't want that. you know, so like I thought, wow, I'm destined for great things. And I thought, why should I bother going to graduate school? I'll just go off and be a famous writer. So I got a black turtleneck and you can see how all of my suffering is born of, of myself, right? It's all self-induced. So I got a black turtleneck and I told everybody that I was a writer and that kept me busy for about 10 years. Um, wearing the black turtleneck and telling everybody that I was a writer. And then uh, right before I turned 30, I thought I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to write something. And so uh, I started to write. I started by doing two pages a day. Um, I started to send the stories out um, and um, I collected um, a ton of rejection letters. And, uh, and I don't think, I think I told you this, Anne, that Louise, Anne is friends with Louise Erdrich, that um, Louise came to the, the book warehouse where I worked and I came down to get my book signed and everybody shoved me forward and said, Kate writes, Kate's a writer. And Louise was so lovely to me. And she said, how long have you been writing? How long have you been getting rejection letters? And she said, hold on for about six years, then things will open up. And things did open up in six years. So, um, yeah. Louise is such an oracle. Right. I mean, and I felt it was a, such a generous thing to do. I felt totally seen and it gave me hope. And it also validated me because, you know, I mean, how many people are shoved in front of her saying, I'm a writer, I'm a writer. And, and she just, she was so lovely to me. And can so, I, can I throw, can I throw a Louise story in? Yeah. I was at Iowa and I was 21 and I was the babysitter and housekeeper for a Jory Graham and Jim Galvin. And they were having a big party for Louise and I was cooking and, and I was in the kitchen scrubbing pots and making canapes. And Louise Erdrick came in and she had at that point only published Love Medicine. And she was luminous. She had this long white dress on. I mean, it was really like, God walking into the kitchen and she stood at the sink and talked to me for 20 minutes in the middle of that party. And it, it is truly one of the warmest memories uh, of my life and certainly of graduate school. Oh, 
And I, I, that is a beautiful story. You know, this yeah. is kind of how our exchanges go all the time now since you're working on this book of essays. But I like want to say, write an essay about that. Yeah, it's, see, and that is how Kate DiCamillo influences my work. It, and that's actually really true that I will say something and, and she's like, no, no, that's that's what I'm interested in right there. Tell that mm. story. And that's, that's, a, that's beautiful. A great I can see that whole thing. And you at 21, like it was Cinderella with your hands in the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And here comes the fairy godmother. Um, okay, Guy, how are you doing? Good. I'm good. I have a question for you, Anne. Have you ever written any characters that are so different from yourself that you really had a terrible time writing them? Boy, I think that question needs to come in the opposite direction. Okay. <laughs> written a character that was so much like myself that I mm -hmm. had a job. Uh, I, uh, you know, I really subscribe to the idea that anybody who is not me is not me. Um, and, and these people are not me. And it takes a lot of time and thought to get into somebody else's life. I'm trying to think of the characters that I have written who have been the very, very farthest away from me. But I don't know, you know, they're, it's, it's, they're all made up of you in some ways. They're, nobody is you and they're all you mm -hmm. in almost That's equal measure. Yeah. Kate, your friend Anne has written about children and she writes for adults. Have you ever thought about writing for adults? I feel like, you know, um, I mean, there's one right here. She, um, writes, she writes for adults. Uh, <laughs> okay, I see what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's odd because, uh, and this is a long thing, like Ann and I could have a big conversation just about this realization that we've had going back and forth about me. I, I have written for adults. It's where I started was writing for adults. And I'll just, I'll just make it short, though, and say I feel like um, I am my best self and the stories are their best selves when I'm writing uh, for kids. And, um, and I have been so lucky that I have found that adult readers have found me and read them, read the stories for themselves as well as with their kids. So I'm just going to keep on writing what I write. And, and if I can say, I sometime early on in the pandemic, I wrote a piece for the New York Times, which was actually really funny. I wrote it for the bookstore blog post. I'm, I you know, co-own this bookstore Parnassus in Nashville and I'm always writing for the blog post. And I wrote a piece about how great it was to read Kate's books right now. Because if you, if you didn't have great concentration and you were distracted by the fact that the world felt like it was falling apart around us, that you could sit down and read one of her novels and have the full experience of a novel in two hours and, and how profoundly satisfying and comforting that was. And when I finished writing the blog post, I read the piece and I thought, wait, this is kind of good. And so I sent it to, I sent it to the New York Times and they published it you know, three days later. And I have people stop me in the grocery store, stop me while I'm walking my dog, stop me everywhere and say, oh, thank you so much. Those Kate D. Camillo books, that's exactly what I needed right now. Um, so I think that it really is a matter of just pointing out a, an evident truth. And that is a skill that I have from being a bookseller, you know, that we don't have to shop only in our sections that there's a whole range of things that we might be interested in. Sometimes we just need someone else to point them out to us. And you also have that skill, not only from being a bookseller, but from being an essayist. And this is like something like that. I'm like always paying attention to how you clarify your own thinking by writing the essay. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a wondrous thing to be, to, to be present, to watch all that happen and watch it coalesce. Something just popped up on the side of the screen that said, "I read that article and immediately bought Edward Tulane." See, the power Ooh, of Ann the power of Ann Patchett. That's the truth, and the power I'm of the. So power. Sorry. I'm sorry. so sorry to interrupt, but I hate to say this. We've reached the end of our.
conversation. You two can talk afterwards, but we have to end right here. And yeah. I want to thank you both so much for letting me be in on this conversation. This has been one of the most fun things I've done throughout this entire festival. So oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Bye. This Bye. has been Bye. wonderful. Bye. 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 Just call, me, just call me and we'll keep talking about this. <laughs> I, I want to let our audience know that we've been talking with Ann Patchett and Katie Camillo. Ann Patchett's most recent book is The Dutch House, and Katie Camillo's most recent book is Stella Endicott and the Anything is Possible poem. Thank you both so much for being here. And if you want to hear more from Kate and Ann, they have recorded a special video for us. And you can see that video if you log on to nationalbookfestival.com and go to the children's stage.